If you'll just turn over to Romans 6, and we're going to focus there in the first few verses of Romans 6. And speaking of the Greek, I'm speaking on the, the uh, subject of baptism. So actually the, the title of the message is just baptism. And so today I'll be talking about baptism. And one of the things that um, we're focused on in the, in the month of March is just the foundations of the faith. In other words, the things that, that are, in essence, spiritual meat. You know, once saved, always saved, baptism, why we go soul winning, why the Word of God, things like that. You know, and it's interesting because sometimes it's the things that people have heard over a long period of time that we take for granted. You know, I know even something uh, as simple as Pastor Cobb preached a message or a few messages in the last couple of weeks about, um, you know, uh, the Lord's Supper. And because people grow up going to church, even if it's the wrong church you hear of, uh, or you go through some of these motions, you just take it for granted and never really look up the meaning or what the Bible has to say about it. And we're just going to do a simple study. It's Wednesday. You know, it's a good day to do a Bible study on the Word of God, and we're going to go over baptism. So there in Romans 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are, that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized in G into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with his baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. And so we're going to actually cover a couple of verses there. But in the meantime, just keep your finger Romans 6 and just go to Matthew and one of the things that we're going to do, I haven't done this in quite some time, but this is one of those sermons that, that just kind of gives itself to that. And we're, we're going to go over the who, what, where, when, and why, and then just a couple of notes on baptism and, and what the world will try to make you think of it. You know, for centuries, you know, for as long as uh, Christianity has existed, basically since the beginning of time and after the death of Jesus Christ, well, really mostly since after the death of Jesus Christ, because... He came and he actually was baptized. He gave us that example. You know, there's been this fight about baptism, whether how it, you scripturally baptize someone and what it means to be baptized, when you should baptize, why, who does it. You know, and I mean, I, I'm a perfect example. I try not to do that, but, you know, that it's, a, it's, it's an easy uh, example and it's a good example for others. You know, I was born into a Catholic home. You know, not any, not a very good Catholic home, but I was, I have pictures where I'm in, you know, this white dress. Because even for boys, they put on a white dress. I mean, I hate to say it. Oh, my parents weren't trying to get me to cross-dress. That's just the tradition of the Catholics. And I was sprinkled. Nobody asked me if it was okay with me. Nobody checked my salvation. That's just what, you know, the Catholics and these false religions will push. And then, uh, fast forward a few years later, about the age of 15, I was baptized again. And I mean, by the way, I'm using the term loosely. I was really just dunked in water and dunked in filthy water, you know, because my brother and I got, got baptized and we make fun of him. Anyways, long story short. But, you know, the weird thing about that time is that one stood out in my mind because I always thought it was really weird because I had to go through a class. You know, it was a, through, when I was a seventh day of medicine. I think it was, now it's been so long. I don't know if it was six weeks or six months, but it was six of something. And I remember the pastor of that church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, would come to our house and sit with my brother and me. We went through a whole workbook, and I hated it. And we had to answer questions. It was fill in the blank. It was like we went to school, and then we had to actually do more schooling. And so then come Thursday night or whatever night he was coming, then, and then after we completed that, and I, I don't remember if we took a test or not, or if it was just a completion, then we were qualified to baptize. But the Bible gives us clear instruction what the qualification is for baptism and what you know, it means to be baptized. So let's look there. I'm going back to, you, while you're there in Matthew, just real quick, I'd like to reread that. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? See, the, the Bible is saying, look, are we going to continue in sin now that we've found grace? You know, and many of the arguments are, you know, especially with easy believism, is, you know, that we're giving people a license to sin. And I have preached on that, and I've mentioned that, so I'm not going to rehash that, but that's not what this is talking about. It's actually telling us that we should do something, and we're going to see that right there. It says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not 
that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ, so it's like, right? So we see it's an image, it's the symbolism of something, was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also, and there's that key word, should walk in newness of life. See, there's, there's all kinds of belief system of baptism, none of it biblical. We're going to focus on what's biblical because a lot of people believe that you have to be baptized to be saved. You know, there's people that believe that, you know, that's why there's infant baptism. It's more of, you know, securing that because, you know, the, the kids can't make that decision. But we have biblical uh, proof that if a child is in the, before the age of accountability, they'll go to heaven if they die. And that's all other sermon for another day. But we see here that it's just an image of. It's our first sign of obedience to Jesus Christ saying, you know, now we've believed and now we want to or we should walk in newness of life. That doesn't mean that we're going to live uh, a perfect life, but we're going to strive or we're going to uh, reach forth. You know, we're going to renew daily towards that goal, right? And so we, let's look right there. You know, and, I, and I, I don't really do like say, hey, let's go back to the Greek or the Hebrew for a number of reasons. Number one, you know, that's a, that seems to be a very seminary Bible college thing. And I have nothing against anybody who's actually studied the Hebrew or the Greek. But two semesters or three semesters of anything are, are proof that you don't learn the language. I've, you would not believe how many people I've met in my life that say, oh man, I took two years of Spanish, but I can't remember anything that I learned in Spanish. So I don't want to, but you know, people say, I took three semesters of Spanish in college and two some two years of, uh, of Spanish in high school, and I can't. So, I mean, it's not, it's kind of pointless to go back to something if you don't understand it completely. But the only thing I will say is the reason I bring it up is because the word baptizo is bautizo in Spanish. So that's the only reason it carries the same meaning, and all it is is to properly submerge, you know, to immerse, to dip under. So baptism for us, first of all, and we will show you the verses, is to, to, to submerge underwater. Because even now... I remember going back, I was uh, about 17 or 18, this is before I went to college. My first year of college, I went to Baylor University, but I had a, uh, a girlfriend, and by the way, you know, this is a long time before I got saved, this is a very worldly way of doing things, you know, you have girlfriends and you break up and all that, which is a really messed up way to do things, because breaking a girl's heart is not ever a good thing. You know, the one thing that's great is my wife, I was her first boyfriend, and that's it, she'll never have a broken heart over that. And women sometimes never recover over that. Even guys sometimes will never recover over that. That was just a, a rabbit trail that probably should be addressed at some other point. But the, the thing is, I had a girlfriend who was staunch Catholic. And she wanted me to marry her before I went to college. Actually, she didn't even want me to go to college. She just wanted me to marry her. I knew at 18 I wasn't ready to be married for many reasons. Uh, you know, if you grew up in Christ and you were actually trained up the way you should go, I'm all for getting married young. But when I was 18... You know, I, my mind was elsewhere. You know, I was not thinking straight. Uh, I definitely was not mature, didn't want to, any of that. But one of the things that she encouraged was she's like, look, we can take you to the church. The priest will baptize you. They'll put you through the first. Like they were willing to, you know, even at my older age, they were going to take me through all their catechisms to make sure that I was a good Catholic so I could get married. Because if you're not a good Catholic, you can't marry another Catholic. But they'll justify it all. But what was interesting is even as an adult, they were willing to sprinkle me. But that's not baptism, you know, according to the Bible, baptism is something different. So Matthew 3, 13, what does the Bible tell us, tell us about um, baptism? It says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it not to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, then suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And, uh, you know, a couple of things that stand out there is he went straight up, um, straight, straightway out of the water. 
So you can't get sprinkled if you're coming straight out out of the water. You know, and, and by the way, I'm not preaching anything that you've probably never heard before. You know, if you've been in a good Baptist church all your life, if you've had independent doctrine, if you've been taught from the King James, this is not anything, uh, there's nothing new under the sun, but it's an important doctrine because people don't understand these things and then they get off on rabbit trails that lead them off on false doctrines and then they believe things that, that could lead them to works-based salvation. You know, um, what's interesting, and I'm going to touch a little bit on it because as I was preparing for this today, you know, just kind of reviewing, I got a call from someone that uh, I met when I was uh, in the dental industry and he was a, a rep for a big company called Henry Shine and he sends me a text. He's like, hey, is this still your number? I was like, who's this? And he says, oh, it's so-and-so. And I said, oh, are you the guy? Because, you know, I meet so many people along the way. I'm like, are you the guy that works in airports? And he re replies, you know, laughing out loud or LOL. And then it clicked on me and I called him and I was like, oh, I remember you, you know, uh, from Henry Schein. He's like, yeah. He goes, by the way, you know, because of the hard conversation you had with me several years ago, I've now decided that I want to go into the seminary. Now, the challenge is, he's like, but I wanted to go into the Presbyterian seminary. And then I said, well, the first thing we need to do is we need to make sure that you're saved by grace. You know, we actually talked about a lot, and I got a clear answer. And this is where this is where why it's so important, because you start to get some clear answers, but then you touch other subjects of salvation, like can you lose it, or if you kill yourself, and all of a sudden you hear that doubt. So I don't even know if he's completely saved. He had to leave. Uh, he was actually texting me to get my email, so he didn't have that much time. I'm, I'm the type that if you text me, I'm going to pick up the phone. I still don't like texting as much as other people do, so I caught him at a at a bad time, but you know, I'm going to call him back tonight because the very first thing is his salvation. Who cares if he goes into the seminary? Who cares if he does all this if you don't understand the basic doctrines? And you know, people think, oh, I'm saved because I believe in Jesus Christ. You can't lose it. But then you ask him key questions like, can you lose it for this? Or what about ha this happens? And all of a sudden they're doubting. Well, it's the same thing with baptism. People think that you got to get baptized for a number of reasons, none of them being biblical. You know, what did the Bible say? He says, that Jesus got baptized. So first of all, let's get rid of the point that you have to be baptized to be saved because Jesus is the one who's doing the saving. So it's more of an example, right? And then let's focus right there. It says, in, uh, Jesus answering saith unto him in verse 15, suffer it, not, suffer it to be so now, or allow it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, baptism is a good first step of obedience because it allows you to then start wanting or should be wanting to walk in newness of life. See, not everybody that we lead to Christ is getting baptized. And number two, not everybody that we lead to Christ is showing up to church or reading their Bible or, uh, you know, doing the things that God wants you to do. See, that's not a requirement for salvation, but it's a very good requirement if you want to walk in newness of life, right? The Bible is very specific there. And, you know, just a couple... It's very important because people that we run into get saved, but maybe we're, we're uh, when we lead them to Christ, you know, maybe next week out of tradition or because of family pressure, they're going to go back to some of these churches until they continue, unless they want to walk in units of life. And they'll go back to an Eastern Orthodox church or an Eastern Catholic or a Catholic church or a Methodist or Presbyterian or Lutheran. Guess what? All of them sprinkle babies. And I just picked on a couple. I mean, there's a lot of churches that believe that. And that means that they're basically giving people the idea that it's work salvation and they're sending people to hell. You know, you think, oh, really? I mean, baptism is such a basic doctrine of the faith. Is that really as important to preach? Actually, I think it's probably some of the most important things to preach because if you don't know the basics, how do you get to be the expert? You know, you can't, uh, you can't just read a book on driving cars and think that you're an expert driver. You know what you got to do? You got to drive the car. So you can't just talk about baptism with people in general without going through the biblical principles of it and actually telling people what it is to be baptized and expect them to understand what it is to walk in newness of life. You know, I remember when I got saved, the one thing that the pat and, and I, I do appreciate that about the pastor that led me to salvation, he's like, look, the first step of obedience is salvation. I mean, uh, that's the first step of obedience in the faith, right? Let's, so we don't get that uh, uh, mixed up. But the first step of obedience now that you're saved is baptism. He says, when do you want to get baptized? And what was interesting is it just made sense to me that I wanted to do that. And I immediately that Sunday, you know, I think I got saved on a Monday or Tuesday. That Sunday I got baptized. And I remember calling my parents and I said, look, I just got baptized. I got saved on Monday. And they're like, what do you mean you got baptized? 
You got baptized when you were 15. I have the certificates in your book because they gave you a certificate. And I was like, no, that's not baptism because the Bible says that you have to be saved to be baptized. So, you know, and I'm not, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but, you know, what is baptism? So we know it's a full immersion and it's a requirement for a first sign of obedience. It's not a requirement for salvation. There'll be people in heaven who never got baptized. And an easy example of that is the thief on the cross. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody dunked him. Nobody sprinkled him. Nobody did anything. He's in heaven. He's been in heaven for well over 2,000 years, you know. So you're still there. Go to Matthew, Mark. Go to John. John 3. Go to the book, uh, the book of John. And we're going to see just a, a couple more examples. John 3, verse uh, 22 says, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized and John also was baptizing in Anion near Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. And so what's another, that's another good point in, ca in case people want to fight you. You can't baptize with a little bit of water. The, the, the point I'm trying to make there is that's why it's called a full submersion. You know, it takes for us here in our baptistry, it takes us all night to fill this up so that we can fully dunk you. You know, uh, about a year ago, uh, I baptized a guy who was 6'8". And he just like dwarfed over me. It was really funny, uh, you know, when you look at it, because I'm five foot five and a half. But in order to baptize that guy, we had to have so much water that when I dunked him in the in the baptistry, the water overflowed into the the pews. You know, you can't do that if there's not much water, right? You have to have a lot of water to baptize somebody. Go to just to, just go back up to verse one. The Bible says there was a man of uh, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to see Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher, come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with thee. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then pay attention right here. It says, and it gives us a description. It says, that which is born of the flesh is a flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And so this is actually talking about salvation. But people will want to use this as baptism for salvation, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I wanted to make sure you guys saw where we were going this. The requirement is to be born again is by faith. And that's why he separates that in verse number six. He says, that which is born of the flesh is of the flesh. So when people talk about water baptism for salvation, what they're doing is they're lying to you. Because right here he separates out. He says, except a man be born of water. And what does that really say? You know, I mean, now I've had two children, so I have a little experience with this. You know, the Bible says, I mean, the Bible, the, my wife, I remember saying, you know, my water broke. Or... I think for the first child, we had to, Mary Sarah had to be induced because of her high blood pressure. And what they do, they broke her water. So that's, and then it backs it up in verse 6. It says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And then in verse, uh, continuing, it says, that which is born of the spirit is of the spirit. And so then he says, uh, in verse 5, he says, he cannot, uh, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so the point here I'm trying to make is we see that, Jesus starts out by talking about salvation, and then we see in the verses 22 and later that he's talking about, you know, a water baptism. And I mean, I guess I should have inverted those, but, you know, that's sometimes we write our notes and that's how we get them. But what we see here is that salvation is the first requirement. So what is baptism? You know, baptism is a full submersion of someone, and it's a sign of obedience. You know, it represents the death. You know, that's why it says this, he came straight out. You have to be, you know, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, it's the newness of life. That's why some people say, you know, buried in, in the like, likeness of your uh, death, raised in the likeness of your resurrection. Or other people will say raised in, to newness of life. Because when Jesus was resurrected, then it's part of the whole salvation process. Jesus had to do it all, and we have to believe it in all. You know, Romans 10 tells us that we believe that God raised him from the dead so that we know that, you know, that's the newness of life. The newness of life is that Jesus now dwells in our spirit. He's made us a new spirit. He can't, the flesh is still corruptible, but one day it will be incorruptible, right? 
And it is the, you know, again, I'm just going to make that point. It's the first sign of obedience. You know, and if you can't do that, how are you going to do all the other things? You know, that's, that's really my, my question and, and the way that people, because people say, can you do great things for the Lord? I believe you can uh, without being baptized. I mean, but chances are it's probably a minority. You know, I mean, honestly, it's probably the exception to the rule because baptism is such a simple thing. I mean, you say, hey, look, um, you're getting saved. Now that you're saved, let's find some water, water and let's dunk you in symbolism to Jesus Christ. I mean, I've seen people get baptized in pools. We can baptize them here. You know, we could go to a pond. As long as they fit, we could baptize them, right? So why baptism? Well, let's go to, I mean, don't go to, go to Acts uh, well, I'll just read for you Colossians 2, verse 12. But go to Acts. And in Colossians 2, verse 12, it says, Buried with him in baptism. So we see that symbolism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So see, it's just a symbolism. It's a, like, it's a figure of something. It's a likeness so that you know, you, you're not ashamed of it. You're excited. You want to do things for Christ. And the Bible is very clear that not everybody does that. You know, Romans uh, 3, 4, or 5, especially, I, you know, you've heard me read. I'm not going to do that because I do that quite a bit. But Romans 4, verses 4 and 5 talks about that. How if we're working for a goal, it's counted to dead. But if we just believe, then we're justified, right? That there's no need to work. Now, when and where do we get baptized? Because that's the other question, like, you know, when should we get baptized and, and, you know, where or how should we get baptized? Well, the Bible gives us a great example, and I'm going to read it all in context, because one of the things I like to do when, and this is maybe more for my edification, but it's just kind of put things in context, because one of the things people want like to do is take things out of context. And I didn't realize how bad it is until you talk to someone who goes to seminary, and then they're throwing verses out at you, and you're like, look, man, that verse you just talked to me about has nothing to do with what you're talking about because you forgot to read all uh, the other verses around that chapter. But just for the sake of here, let's read. It says, in the angel in verse 26 of Acts, verse 26 of Acts 8, verse 26, it says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go towards the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had, charge of, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Or in the Old Testament, Isaiah, right? I mean, the, this is a translated in the New Testament. And it says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to thy uh, to this chariot. So a couple of things we see, and this is why it's important to get these foundations, is Philip, the Spirit moves. You ever been somewhere and you just move to talk to somebody about Christ? And I've had both instances where I, I respond to that, where the Spirit moves me and you just do it, and you know you need to do it, and there's times where you just didn't. And then guess what? You feel really bad about it, and because you know you need to be obedient to God's call for that. But it says, and Philip ran thither to him. I mean, he didn't waste any time. He didn't walk over, he wasn't sluggish, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And that's why so many is so important, because people believe the only way to get saved is somebody has to guide you. You know, because if you read your Bible on your own and you're unsaved, it's just another book. The Bible doesn't open itself to you until somebody teaches you. You know, I mean, I thought about that, you know, because I've had that argument posed to me over over uh, over time, you know, and as I grew in the Word, I didn't really have a response, but in the past few years, that response becomes clear because the Bible continually talk about teaching and how can they hear unless someone preaches to them and how can they learn unless they, they read the Word of God. And he says here, um, except some man should guide me, and he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. The place of the Scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. And the reason I'm setting this up is because this is important. Philip is leading him to the Lord. He's doing a soul-winning act. He is literally going through the gospel presentation with the Old Testament. And he's, gonna talk, and he's talking to him about Jesus. And he says, uh, 
Uh, oh, so he opened his, not his mouth. Verse 33, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speakest thou the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? So he, he, he's still not getting it. He's like, well, who is he speaking of? Is this guy referring to someone else or, or of himself? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. And what did he do? And preached unto him Jesus. See, you, we preach the gospel first. A lot of people want to get the pews filled. A lot of people want to make baptism part of uh, church membership. You know, and, and if that's how the church wants to do it, as long as they're clear in their gospel presentation, that's fine. The challenge is if you're making that a requirement, not only for membership, but membership into the kingdom of God, then you're going to muddy the water. And there's churches that actually do that. They believe that you have to be baptized to be a member. As a matter of fact, you know, the Catholics do that all the time. You have to be a part of the church and go through the whole process to be, be, be saved. Um, and then we, it says here in verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And this is an important verse because it's, it's funny. I was just talking to that guy, and I blew him away with this. I was going through just why you shouldn't read the NIV, why you shouldn't read all these scriptures. And Philip, in verse 37, says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, Thou mayest, and he said, and, and, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, notice he had to come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now, I just threw that part in there because I just think it's really great that Philip's with him one minute, and the next thing you know, he's not with him. And the, the eunuch wasn't even like uh, shocked because he was out there. He went on his way rejoicing. But what we see here is if you turn to like these new perversions, specifically I'm speaking of the NIV, that verse is just omitted from the Bible. And, you, and, the, and the worst part is they blatantly do it. They want you to doubt God's word because they'll put verse eight, uh, Acts 8.36, then they leave a blank, and then they put Acts 8.38. Or sometimes they'll even put 837, and then there's nothing. And then they're like, read the footnote. And usually the footnote will say something along the line of, some manuscripts included here, Philip said. They're, they're basically putting doubt that God could preserve his word throughout eternity past and even to the present, right? And the fact of the matter is either we're, we believe in God's word and the, the fact that nothing, uh, you know, in corruption can, uh, you know, the... God's going to give us an incorruptible body, but it has to be born of incorruptible blood, the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ. But if we have a corruptible word, it can't breed incorruption. It doesn't go both ways, right? It's not, a, it's not like a formula that works on both sides of the, the equation. It's not. It's not equal at all. You know, because God, is through His Son Jesus, is the only way that we could be saved. So we need a pure word to save others. Because when you're doing things like this, what you're doing is causing confusion. And the Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion. Go uh, there to Acts 16. And then we're going to see another example of, you know, when and where do we get baptized. If you see, where did he get baptized? They found water and they got him baptized. When? Immediately. Now, most people that you meet out there soul winning, you know, it takes them some time, especially if you run into the fact that they, uh, they say, well, I've already been baptized, even after they accept Jesus Christ, because they understand it to be that they just got done. And that's why I always clear that up. I was like, no, you've never been baptized, because baptism is only after you get saved. You've been dunked in water. You know, go to Acts 16, uh, 25, and we're talking, you know, this is when Paul is in the prison. It says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundation of the prison was shake were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul in silence. He had the fear of God. That's why I put that, that whole context, because... You know, he's fearful of God because he's just seen a great thing, right? And brought them out and said, Sirs, and we use this all the time when we're soul winning, 
what must I do to be saved? Because it's the only one where you, it's a clear question. What must I do to be saved? And they spake unto him the word, uh, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straight way. And so we see in verse 25, it says, And at midnight, then all this transpires, he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, and when does he get baptized? That same hour. They didn't go to sleep. They're like, you know what? Sleep on it. You know, sleep on this thing of baptism. See if you really want to take that first step of obedience. No, right away. When you get baptized, immediately. So one of the things that we should encourage believers that have uh, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ is to get baptized. Because I honestly believe we need a multi-pronged approach to changing the course, not only of America, but, you know, of the world in this generation. See, soul winning is very important. Soul winning, that's probably not. It is the most important in the sense that we don't want people to go to hell. If I had a choice between talking to you about Christ and baptism, I'm going to talk to you about Christ first. But you know what? Once you get it, there's no need for me to beat a dead horse. Once saved, always saved. There's no need of me repeating that, that whole thing and just keep going over the fact that you, you, know, got, you, know, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you believe it, you're going to learn it. It's yours. But now, you should walk in newness of life. So that you don't go back to whatever sins you were committing in your life. And so that, you know, you, you know how to approach sin moving forward. Because you are going to backslide. You are going to sin again. And that way you don't live in this uh, Catholic guilt. Or these things that the Catholics do or maybe other religions that make you feel guilty. You know how to ask for forgiveness. You know how to repent of that sin. That one specific sin, not repent of your sins. And how to move on, right? And so when and where? Immediately, and wherever there's water. Now, today in modern day America, most churches have a baptistry. So, you know, just let's set this thing up and let's get it right and done away. I mean, one of the things that Pastor Cobb emphasizes here is, along, you know, and obviously I do too, is people should be baptized after salvation. And he's told me of stories of people who've been saved for 20, 30, 40 years, and then he explained baptism and they got baptized. So, you know why it, it took 20, 30, 40 years? Because churches don't go back to the principles, the basic doctrines, the basic biblical uh, doctrines of Christ. And so people don't know that it's necessary for walking to newness and life. That it's so that you can be your first sign of obedience. So that you can then show a, uh, a symbolism of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now who should be baptized? And then I'm going to actually touch very lightly on who should baptize. You know, because that's not a... Uh, a dogmatic, clear doctrine in the Bible. So I'm just going to give you one reference. Go to Mark 1. Because, I, I mean, there's really, I mean, we could spend a lot of time on here. We could argue to we're blue in the face. Who should be baptized is very clear. Who should baptize? The Bible kind of gives us a good indication, but there's no clear scripture that says this type of person should baptize. We see there in Mark 1, verse 4, it says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach them, preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost." And we see in this scripture that what it's doing is setting up, I mean, we see this in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where John was sent out to proclaim Jesus, to make, pave the way for Jesus. So we're talk, he's clearly talking about salvation here. And you know, obviously this is not a salvation message. I'm not going to go into all of that. But the other thing we see here is a good example. John is the one who, that's where we get John the Baptist. You know, we, a lot of people think that we're Baptist because of John the Baptist. Actually, we're Baptist for multiple reasons. That's one of them. But the, the main thing here is John was ordained of God. You know, he was a minister of the gospel. So who should baptize? In my opinion, based on the Bible, the only times you see people baptizing are people that have been ordained to the ministry. Either apostles, disciples, you know, preachers. You know, John the Baptist was actually, you know, he was picked specifically for the, the purpose of paving the way for Jesus Christ. So I don't think just anybody should baptize. That's my personal opinion. You know, I didn't even discuss that with uh, Pastor Cobb. 
I don't know that he disagreed with me much on that. It's not dogmatic. I'm not going to sit here and argue with him on that. But just based on the Bible and what you see who baptizes, you know, that I would err on the side of caution. Meaning, I don't just want any Joe Blow down the street baptizing people just because he thinks he's really cool. Because it's something to be, it's a serious thing. The other thing is you want to at least know that the person who's doing the baptizing, and that's not always the case with false religions, but at least the person who's doing the baptizing has some idea of what the Bible says about baptism. You know, you don't just want anybody, you know, the Bible says lay, no, lay hands on no man suddenly. That means that it's a requirement for you to have some basic understanding, not just of certain scripture, but all scripture. I mean, you should have at least read this a couple of times in your life if you're going to do something as serious as tell someone, hey, I'm going to bury you and then, uh, in the water and then raise you to newness of life. You know, because at least you have an idea of why you're doing it. It has some significance to them and to you. It's an important thing. Now, you know, the person getting baptized is the one who's doing the symbolism. So it has nothing to do with the person baptizing, but I just think it's an important thing. You know, if you disagree with that point, study your Bible, you know, and let the Spirit speak to you. But if, because it's not very clear as to who should baptize, but we see that it's leaders in the church, people who are ordained, who are, who are chosen of God to do great works for Him. Now, and, and let me back that because that sounds like a, only people who are ordained do great works for him. As a matter of fact, there's many who do great works for him. Remember, the Bible tells us that God, uh, uh, God had left himself a remnant of 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. But God does specifically name those leaders who are going to have a specific task in his ministry for him. You know, if you're ordained to the ministry, well, it's your job and your duty to be a pastor of a church. You have a different duty than those that just come to church. Because those that come to church also have jobs and, you know, have a different career choice and things like that. But as far as the gospel and going out there and doing things for Christ, that's what it is. So let's, let's just close this out. Just got a couple more things and we're done. You know, the Bible, important notes about baptism. So we just went over the who's, what's, where, and where. Just important things to know, you know, we want to make sure that they're dunked. And I know I've said that from now and I'm saying it again. But apparently, even with the Bible and all the scripture given, and, you know, preachers throughout history teaching this, because I'm not the first one to ever preach on baptism. This is, as a matter of fact, of all the sermons that I've preached, this is probably the, if you were to type in on Google or YouTube baptism, there's probably more sermons on baptism than any other subject, other than probably how to get saved. And you're going to find both sides of the spectrum, right? But people are still sprinkling to this day. You know, people still, you ever... And then, uh, you know, you get them and then they, they sprinkle the water and then they do some kind of weird oil thing on the face and they think that, that then now they're good and they're sealed. And that's not what baptism is. You know, and the other thing is if baptism was required for salvation, then why would Jesus get baptized? Was Jesus a sinner? You know, did Jesus fall from grace? No, Jesus left that as an example for us. And that's a really good point to make to people that are looking to be baptized. And then the other thing is that there is a certain, you must be baptized correctly. Go to Acts 19, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all the scriptures, but just go to there to uh, uh, verse 1, and it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos, I mean, uh, sorry, go to verse, uh, oh, there, no, yeah, start in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? So he's asking them if they've believed, if they received that Holy Ghost. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be an Holy Ghost. Now, if you haven't heard that there's a Holy Ghost, then you know what? You haven't believed on Jesus. Because the Bible is very clear that when we preach Jesus Christ, when we're out soul winning, we preach God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because people preach a different Jesus, right? And look, Paul makes it clear. He says, and he said unto them, unto what then? Were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. So they're saying, look, John baptized, so we thought we were just getting baptized to him. And they said, Paul, and then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the gospel, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So two things that stand out. Number one, John baptized correctly. These guys didn't get it. That happens. You know, 
Sometimes people, I guarantee you, we've prayed the sinner's prayer with them. They said they're saved by grace. They said they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were just doing it to appease me and get me out of their door. And they probably didn't get saved. That's why we're very careful to count numbers. We usually err on the side of the smaller numbers, right? And here, and then the other thing is, look, did, did Paul go, okay, well, you didn't believe on the Holy Ghost. Let me clear that up for you. It's Jesus Christ who you believe. Let me make sure you understand the gospel. And then he left. No, he says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, the other one didn't count. The only one that counts is after you're saved by Jesus Christ. See, I, I, in my life, technically, I've been baptized once, but I've been sprinkled and then dunked at least three times. You know, I was sprinkled as a baby, then I got dunked at 15, and then I finally got baptized at 25. So I... You know, I, I like to know how old I was when I was probably a baby, like a year old, but because, you know, it's like fives. But that's the thing here is important is that we should clear that up with people that are new to our church and clear that up with even new believers. Because there are people that are going to tell you, well, no, I've been baptized. And this is a good verse to take them to and say, look, if you were baptized before, it wasn't baptism. It was just dunking. Now that you understand the gospel, now that you believed on Jesus, now you should get baptized, you know, and uh for the sake of time, I'm going to go over. And then here's just a couple of common scriptures that people try to do to justify baptism by salvation. And it's just good to know them and good to know how to overcome them. Because, you know, that's where these false religions, they'll go to the Bible to try to promote their false religion, right? I mean, if you talk to a Jehovah's Witness, they'll spend all their time in the Old Testament. If you talk to a Seventh-day Adventist, they'll bring you all the verses on the Sabbath except the ones that they don't want to talk about, like in Leviticus, Right? That's what they do. Well, when it comes to baptism, there's only like two or three verses they pick at. But the, here's the main thing. Number one, I want to encourage you. We should know how to look up or how to read the entire Bible, not just one verse out of context. And then the other thing is just know what the attacks are so we know how to overcome them. From the Bible, I'm not giving you a how-to based on what I think. I'm giving you a how-to based on the Bible. You know, 1 Peter 3, verse 18, and you don't have to turn that for the sake of time. It says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, that the, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, and that's where we want to focus on when someone comes to you with these verses about water baptism for salvation, the like figure, you know, this, this is easy for our generation to understand because we grew up with action figures. And action figures weren't the real thing. It was just a symbol or a look-alike of the real thing, right? The like figure we're unto, even baptism, doth also, also now save us. And then we see a parenthetical. Now the putting away of the filth of the flesh, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers mean, being made subject unto him. And what they'll do is they'll just say, look, see, it says that the like figure were unto even baptism, this also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what they'll do is just break it up. So if you break it up like that, it does sound like he's saying that you need to be baptized to be saved. But we learn that when we're reading a book of any kind, we got to pay attention to grammar. And I mean, that's why we go to school, right? So we can learn how to read. Because the one thing my wife hates is all run-on sentence. And apparently I'm really good because she's like, what are you trying to tell me here? Well, the guy, you know, we look here, it's not a run-on sentence. There's parentheticals, there's commas, there's things that are separating this out so you understand. It says, the like figure were unto even baptism doth also now save us. And if we remove the parenthetical, the sentence stays the same. It says, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's saying, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But let's just put the parenthetical to understand it. God put that there for a reason, right? It says, not putting away the filth of the flesh. So see, the baptism can't do it because if water were to cleanse our way our sins, then that would be a contradictory statement because it says you can't put away the filth of the flesh. See, we live in the flesh. We're corruptible. We're separated by God. I mean, to think the thoughts that we think, to do the things that we do even after salvation, still separates us from God. The only thing that keeps us there is but, but there it says, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, and then we see, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, it's Jesus Christ that saves us. 
It's his blood that washed us. It's he's the one that did all the work. The baptism is just because now we want to walk in units of life. Now we want to do great works for the Lord. And now we want to show others that we're obedient to his word. It's an it's a outward uh, show of, of that affection, right? Then the other uh, uh, place that we'll go to, and, and I will close out with that, is in Mark 16, 15. And, uh, you know, because I already read for you John 3, we saw that those verses there were, except the man be born of water and the Spirit. And since I got ahead of myself, I already explained that. So that's the other, uh, the, the other one where you see in John 3. But in Mark 6, 15, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is, and is baptized shall be saved. But there again, there's the grammar, right? We see a semicolon. So they're going to clear that up. It says, but he that believeth shall not be damned. Now, if baptism was necessary, it would say, but he that believeth and is not baptized, or he that wasn't baptized shall be damned. But the Bible cleared it up. It says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But the only requirement is the belief. They added the and, right? I could say, you know, when it says in Acts 16, 30, it says, and thy house shall be saved. It's just saying, look, if you go preach it to your house, they'll be saved. But who's going to be saved? That one that believes. Because everybody has to believe on Jesus Christ. But he that believeth shall not be damned. You know, and it's real important. That's why it's so good to just read the, number one, the King James, because it's very simple. You know, people argue that that old English is really hard to read. But the reality is it actually makes you better at English. And it's a very simple English. You know, I mean, you can't go wrong with he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, that sounds like he's saying we need to be baptized. But look, there's a semicolon. Let's see what that clears up for us. But he that believeth shall not be damned. And does it correlate or does it coincide with the rest of the verses in the Bible? Well, there's more than plenty of verses. And, you know, I'm not, that's not the sermon we're preaching today. But there's plenty of verses that say that he that believeth shall have everlasting life. If you believe, believeth, believing, believe. What does he give them? Everlasting life. You know, it's never believe in all these requirements because if not imagine imagine the hard work we'd have to do and then uh you know we read john but i'll close out with this i do want to include that just for the sake you know because you're tying all these verses and the bible it's very clear it says in, in hebrews 9 11 says but christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For of the blood of bulls and of goats, so if the blood couldn't do it, why would the water do it? It says, but if the blood and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, and the sprinkling can't, so we, we overcome the sprinkling, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, perch your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And we see this. This is a picture of Jesus Christ shedding that blood for us once and for all. You know, if you wanted to talk about any baptism, it's a spiritual baptism because we're washed in his blood. You know, we're, we're immersed in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the spiritual blood that cleanses us from all sin. But should we get baptized? Absolutely. I think so. It's not necessary. I'm not saying it's a requirement. I'm not going to run a poll here in church and say who's baptized. If you're not, don't ever come back. No, but we should get so we have that newness of life so that people know, see our outward obedience to Christ and so that they know that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a conscious choice. You know, um, the, the best way to describe it, and I'll close out with that, is, you know, it says that Jesus said he came to do the Father's will, not his will, right? So when we want to do God's will, Jesus' will, the Father's will, you know, we, we willfully make that sign of obedience. We willfully go into the water. We willfully get baptized because nobody can force us unless you're a baby. And then they don't, you know, they really didn't have a choice in the matter. So we should get baptized. Here, I already told you or gave you verses on how we should be baptized. There's probably a lot more that we could preach. I, I mean, if you just look up the word baptize or baptize, there's a ton of verses on there. I just covered a little bit. And, and it, all it was was just a basic study. But it's an important study because the more you look it up, I mean, that's what the world's going to argue when this new one world order comes in. When the Antichrist comes in, they're going to get rid of all these doctrines. And the first thing they're going to do is attack the word of God. And you saw, I mean, I gave you an example today of that. So let's go ahead and just close out with a word of prayer. But Heavenly Father, Lord, you know, it's, uh, 
sometimes we take for granted the things that, that seem to come easy to us. But, it, uh, you know, we should always be diligent to study and to go always, uh, to always be focused on the basics. Because it's from the basics, it's from the foundation that we can build on. We can't have a nice building without a good foundation. And for us, we always want to build on that rock that is Jesus Christ. And then you, you say a lot in your word that's very clear, that's very simple, it's very dogmatic to understand. And there's things that you, you left for us to figure out. And when it comes to this thing of baptism, we understand that it's after salvation. We understand it's not necessary for salvation. We understand it's full immersion. We understand that uh, it's a choice and that it's uh, a good tool for helping us walk in units of life. It won't perfect us. We, that's something we have to renew daily. We have to die to self daily. And then we understand that there will be an attack on that word. Uh, so thank you that you just showed us all this in your word. And then we understand most importantly that it's your blood that washes us from all sin. Not any water, not anything that we do. And so thank you, Lord for uh, just laying this message on us, and I hope that uh, it, it was uh, edifying and helpful to those here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.